Hi folks, thanks so much for joining us for the uh, second Great Seattle Debate on how to contain cancer costs. And I am pleased to introduce one of our first uh, panelists. It's uh, Dr. Brian Kaufman. He is a family practice medicine, or family, family practice doctor of 37 years um, of, at St. Jude Heritage Medical Group in Diamond Bar, California. He is the former medical director of the nonprofit Primary Care Network, and he's helped develop uh, and provide quality accredited CME and continues to uh, teach. He is also uh, offers the unique perspective of being both a doctor as well as a patient. In 2005, he was diagnosed with chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and he has ever since that time uh, taken it upon himself to become an outstanding patient advocate. And it, his position does offer him a very unique perspective and insight into patient care and the cancer, uh, the cancer care delivery system. He has a very popular blog where he talks about his journey with CLL. He is also the volunteer medical director of the highly respected not-for-profit CLL Society dedicated to the unmet needs of these patients. And he is uh, uh, very acclaimed, has won many awards, and he is here after uh, some, some pretty, pretty extensive treatment with CAR-T. So thank you for, for coming. I would like to introduce Dr. Gary Lyman, co-director of the Hutchinson Institute for Cancer Outcomes Research and member of the Public Health Sciences and Clinical Research Divisions at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. He is also professor of medicine and adjunct professor in the schools of public health and pharmacy at the University of Washington. Dr. Lyman's very active with the American Society of Clinical Oncology, serving recently on the ASCO Board of Directors, chairing the Guideline Methodology Committee, and several individual guidelines, including those related to prevention and treatment of venous thrombolism cancer, sentinel node biopsy in early stage breast cancer, and melanoma and appropriate chemotherapy dosing in obese patients with cancer. Dr. Lyman chairs the ASCO Task Force on the role of observational research and clinical practice, and also the working group on biosimilars in oncology. He's also a member of the Value of Cancer Care Task Force and Cancer Research Committee, along with several additional roles within the society. And in 2010, Dr. Lyman received the ASCO Statesman Award. So we definitely appreciate you being with us this morning. It's my privilege to introduce Ken Anderson, a friend of ours. Uh, Ken is a family, Kraft family professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and also the director of the Jerome Lipper Multiple Myeloma Cancer Institute. Uh, Ken is the ultimate physician scientist, and uh, he has not only been the president of the American Society of Hematology, but also the president of uh, International Myeloma Society and a member of the Institute of Medicine uh, of the National Academy of Sciences, a rare privilege offered to only a few uh, physician scientists in the country. His contributions to myeloma uh, are enormous, and he studies uh, both uh, patients and the lab in, in the preclinical models, particularly the tumor microenvironment. Uh, and he has won uh, almost any, all prestigious awards an oncologist can hope to get. And not only really that, I've personally dealt with him, and he is one of the most helpful individuals, and uh, it's a real uh, delight and pleasure to have you, Ken. It's also my privilege to introduce Michael Seiden, uh, who is the President and Chief Medical Officer of the U.S. Oncology Network. He's a leading expert in ovarian cancer and leads one of the largest physician organizations in medical oncology, as you heard a few minutes ago. And if you look at the bio, one thing stood out the most for me, that uh, he went to the best medical school in the world and obtained his MD-PhD, that is Washington University, where I come from. <laughs> <laughs> and it shouldn't be confused with the University of Washington in Seattle, also a medical school, I understand. Um, <laughs> and, 
<laughs> but both get confused often, but both are fantastic medical schools, <laughs> as you know. And uh, Dr. Seiden uh, was the CEO and president of the Fox Chase Cancer Institute uh, for uh, before, uh, before that, he was at MGH, where he began the Gynae Oncology Research Institute, which later on extended to Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. I'm sure it's one of the, one of the rare firsts from going from MGH to Dana-Farber. And uh, he is leading a uh, um, um, uh, large program, and it's a, it's a pleasure to have you, Mike. Thank you. So, you know, I think we'll start off the debate, and as many of you know, and people have been here before yesterday, and uh, we, the whole idea is to have instructional, educational, and if possible, entertaining session here, and we are addressing a serious issue, and I'll, I'll do a little bit of a setup piece, as they say, in the TV business, and, um, you know, the cancer care expense, as per the 2015 estimate, was about $80 billion per year. And that number may be up, or up or very likely uh, in the next in the last few years. And uh, what is uh, important is that the drug cost for patients has gone up sixfold in the last 10 years. And the average cost of the outpatient drug today is estimated to be $135,000 uh, per year. And that's actually quite, quite uh, striking. And of those $80 billion costs, looks like 58% comes from the outpatient care and about 32% from the inpatient care. And uh, one of the challenging aspects that we have is that uh, we have to reduce the overall cost of care. The first segment will focus on what would you do to, you know, uh, as a clinician, payer, manufacturer, to change the status quo, especially for therapies that provide modest or poor value for money. This is a big deal, and while this is changing now with immunotherapy and targeted therapy, for a long time this has been an issue. And what would you do, re really do to change the status quo, especially for the therapies that provide modest to poor value? Perhaps you can start off with you, Mike, and each one will have two minutes, and, um, and then uh, we'll have time to rebut, and we'll start off with Mike, and then we'll move down. Yeah. So. Uh you know, I think the cost of oncology care is likely to become a much bigger problem uh, before it becomes a simpler problem. And uh, I think a number of the efforts uh, regarding competition and transparency are um, good first starts. But realistically, we're going to have to tackle, I think, some much more challenging issues uh, to make a big dent in this. Uh, issues regarding how we think about risk and who bears risk. Uh, issues potentially around rationing of healthcare costs and even patient autonomy are all issues I think we're going to have to address in the years to come. I, the, these are all what I would call third rail issues. But um, right now, uh, you know, the healthcare system in many ways is addicted to get bigger, more revenue, uh, you know, more utilization and really changing the paradigms of how we deliver cancer care are going to take some radically different approaches. After throwing that scary thing on the wall, I'll let <laughs> I, I actually totally agree with the good Dr. Seiden. Um, I, I think we really shouldn't be giving uh, drugs or developing drugs that only give modest um, advances or incremental steps anymore. As was mentioned, the drugs cost too much. It's, I uh, recently looked. It's $2.6 billion in 10 years to get a drug, and 5% of those that start actually finish. And we go through the phase one, two, three, and we get to the big phase three trials with hundreds of patients, and we show an incremental difference, and it gets added on. That's not the future. We, we have to collaborate much better than we have academia, biotech, and pharma, the regulators the funders and most important, the patients. But we need to go use the academic models, inform the development. When it gets to the clinical trials, no more big phase three clinical trials, biomarker driven, small number of patients in a trial designed to treat a specific disease and or subset of that disease so that we'll see a difference get it actually approved or not based on a shorter period of time, a short endpoint, much less cost, and most importantly, much more quickly for the patient. So I think, you know, I understand we've had to make modest advances over the years, but we're at an unprecedented time now in terms of science and translation. So I think in both the area of genomics and the area of immunology, 
we really shouldn't, uh, we should rule out early those agents that will maybe have only a small potential and really focus on the ones that can really transform the paradigm. So I guess it's not much of a debate if I agree with everything that they say. <laughs> but um, uh, you know, I'd, I'd take off on uh, some of the comments that were made with the previous session. I think this is a point where we need to be disruptive. We need to be disruptive as a society, as a healthcare environment and system, uh, as providers, uh, as patients, uh, and, and those that advocate for patients. Um, everybody has a stake in this game. Uh, it's become unsustainable, insurmountable for many patients, and we need major changes. And I think attacking only one aspect of it doesn't do justice to the multiplicity of stakeholders uh, that have a, a role to play here and could make a difference. Let's start with the FDA. Uh, the FDA, I was on ODAC, the Oncology Drug Advisory Committee, for eight years. At every single meeting, we were told beginning, don't talk about cost. You're not, cost is not permiss, a, a permissible word in this discussion. The FDA doesn't consider cost in, in, in uh, the uh, discussion of these drugs. And I understand efficacy and safety, and this is congressionally mandated. But not to bring it into the discussion, uh, I, th I think, is, is a, doesn't do everybody uh, justice uh, uh, when it comes to that. The FDA also has to, and this was alluded to, uh, define what they mean by meaningful clinical benefit. Various societies, ASCO, ESMO, others have uh, tried to weigh in on this. Uh, but even though meaningful clinical benefit is a term used at the FDA in the drug approval process, they have never defined what that means. And they need to get everybody to come to the table and agree what we mean uh, by, by meaningful clinical benefits. CMS, Medicare, the biggest payer, a purchaser of drugs in this country, cannot negotiate for drug prices. And they need to, um, that needs to change. Again, congressionally mandated, but there needs to be a way that uh, the, the, the biggest payer for drugs uh, for cancer treatment in this country can actually negotiate like every other developed country health system in the world is capable of doing. That will bring down drug prices. And then, of course, we have what I presented yesterday, biosimilars, competition. Uh, bring in these new versions of the exciting biologic therapies um, to prove that they work and they're safe, and then uh, let the competition, if that's the system we're going to work within, uh, bring down the health care costs uh, for patients. Uh, again, not much of a debate because I agree with all that's been said before, but there's a tsunami coming and I think we stakeholders need to start making the changes or the changes will be made to us. And I, one of the big changes that I see need to be made is there has to be more than lip service to patients being involved from the very beginning. Patients have to be involved in the pharmaceutical companies when a drug is being developed. Is there a need for this drug? Is it meeting an unmet need or is it just a me too drug? Patients have to be involved in what are the clinically important outcomes. We've done research at the CLL Society on this. LRF has done this. LLS has done this. What matters to patients is overall survival, next most important progression, free survival. They don't care that much about response rates. You know, They don't care. You get a big enough sample, you can show a 2% gain that's statistically significant. Patients don't care about adding a couple weeks to their life generally. So you got to get patients involved in every step of this, including all the steps even post-marketing, what's involved, what's going on there. And once you get the patients involved in what's important to them, and then you have, it, once the drugs are out and approved, you have discussions with the patients that are meaningful and saying, yeah, this drug has about a 10% chance of working, it has about a 70% chance of these adverse events. Do you want to do it or not? These kinds of hard discussions have to be had, and we have to give the providers the opportunities to have these kinds of discussions, remove the perverse incentives for them saying, well, you know, if, you, you know, if they get the meds, then I keep this patient around, I'm making more money, they're in an infusion chair, these kinds of things, we have to remove these perverse incentives. So involve the patients from day one till the final days in terms of their decisions. 
Since Binay picked uh, four perfect gentlemen to debate, and you guys all agree, and I want to spice this, spice this up a little bit and bring up some of the great points you all brought up. So can, um, since drugs start off from basic science, drug discovery, and clinical trials, and uh, you, you pointed out, and just to expand this and to clarify to the audience, that 94% of the uh, clinical trials fail. In other words, the success to first in human to approval is in the past have been 7 8%, about, I think you refer to about 5%, roughly speaking. And the cost of a drug uh, development is about 2.3 to $2.8 billion. And um, so one reason the drugs are expensive, and the companies would always say, we'll start off from the drug discovery to clinical trial process and then the endpoints, and we we'll move on to the other issues that, uh, you know, the drug costs. Maybe we can take two issues and expand on that. One is the drug development, which including the clinical trial costs, and then the drug price negotiations. I want to take both these issues one by one. So perhaps you can have this spirit of discussion there. And so, Ken, in the past, the drugs were, uh, you know, developed based on looking for modest differences. So you have to look at 10,000 patients in the adjuvant trial to find a 2% difference, and then the companies went around promoting that and became the standard of care. And, uh, and nobody had the, you know, people were reluctant to speak up against those kinds of benefits, and uh, which are really not benefits. They are fooling ourselves by comparing two, min, uh, you know, minimally, uh, you know, effective therapies. So as the time now gone past, now beyond the phase three, so we should be looking for phase two signals where we look for larger differences, where we can do sh shorter trials, less expensive, and weed out those ineffective therapies that don't really add much except cause. Yes, uh, I, <clears throat> I mentioned that in uh, my opening comment, but absolutely. I've been privileged, I've uh, been in the field of multiple myeloma bone marrow cancer for a long time, almost 40 years, and seen it really transform and been part of, contributed to 22 new FDA approvals for this disease, and it's been transformed in how the patients do, which is what it's all about. Um, so I'm not at all negative about the progress, but I am negative about how long it took to get there. So to your point, uh, if you tried to do anything in the audience that you only succeeded one out of 20 times, you might not continue doing it. You might at least ask why and how I can improve it. So I think in terms of academia, we play a role because we have the disease expertise and we can do the modeling. We can identify targets and validate the targeted agents that might be new. Biotech and industry have a very important role for sponsoring the trials early in uh, uh, clinical development especially, and if they get to phase three, so be it. The regulators, I cannot stress how important and how good they are because the regulators need to be experts in the disease and recognize what kind of experiment or clinical trial would be done to show that it really is a difference and, and then, in fact, help work with industry and with the uh, clinical trial uh, investigators to carry this out in an expedited fashion. But we are in an era now that with, with that cooperation, we can define the targets better than ever before, whether it's genomics or immunologic. We can go first in man quickly and very uh, efficiently. And we can use, in many cases anyway, early readouts at a year and a half, two years, three years, in a relatively smaller number of patients so that we can recognize what would be appear to be a winner or not. Then perhaps it can go out forward into the community uh, much more quickly at much less cost than it is presently. So I think the final thing I'll say is that, uh, oops, I guess I won't. The time is off. <laughs> I, I'll just take off on that. I, I, yeah, and I, I think Ken is you know, right on target with his comments on this. We, to add to this, though, we now have the opportunity through technology, through large data sets, what we call big data, to look at much larger numbers in an observational setting. Um, the FDA is already doing this to some extent in the post-marketing surveillance uh, uh, period for drugs that get approved based on limited clinical data. In this setting, we're to some extent victims of our own success as we identify smaller and smaller subgroups of patients who are potential 
targets for new, innovative, exciting uh, agents. Um, we can't wait until we have 500 patients or 2,000 patients on a phase three trial to decide whether to give access to these drugs that are looking promising. But we do have this access to large data capability. And this, what we unfortunately don't have is an integrated national system, uh, maybe headed out of the NIH, uh, but taking work from the FDA, the NIH, and from larger cancer institutions uh, to, to collate, to have interoperability between these systems so that we can track patients uh, both before but certainly after uh, they're approved uh, to give patients access to see if efficacy is maintained or if we're seeing toxicities that weren't seen in the smaller clinical trials used for approving these. So I think we do have the technology capability. We just need the uh, agreement and resources to uh, pull this national data repository together uh, to, uh, to complement the, the clinical trials that we can do. So uh, a couple things, some high-tech and some low-tech answers to this. The high-tech answers are I think we need to be looking, and I challenge all the researchers, the translational researchers here, to identify the subgroups so we're not throwing a drug at a disease because it's in the lung or it's in the ovaries, but we know what's going on. You're moving in that direction, but the faster we can move in that direction, the better. The second I think we can learn from our European colleagues. Um, my area of expertise is in CLL. Peter Hillman and his group there are doing these fast boat trials, sometimes of 8, 12 patients. They see a signal with a surrogate marker. They add something in. They take something away. They stop this trial. They add a new cohort. They get something there. It's moving really fast. So I think that those kinds of trials get the lawyers out of this. I mean, we can do much smaller trials. The amount, I, you, know, I, you know, I have friends who are researchers, and it just breaks my heart to see how hard it is. They say, you know, we're going to change that protocol because we found this. It's a year and a half later, and they haven't been able to change the protocol because there's so much bureaucracy and so much stuff going on that it's very hard, and a lot of these trials are international, so it's very difficult. So get all that bureaucracy, and I, I know it can't easily be done, but try to make these tr uh, trials faster and smaller and easier. Oh, another piece. Let's make these more accessible. A large reason that trials fail is because there's not enough patients enrolling in them. So, you know, I, I had a friend who had CLL, was doing great in a trial. She had a follow-up scan. They found lung cancer. She dropped, she has to drop out of the trial. Ethically, that's impossible. I mean, as an oncologist, you would never say these, her, can, her CLL drug was working. She couldn't enroll in a trial if she has another cancer. I've had a bone marrow transplant. That kicks me out of a bunch of trials. I didn't engraft. Why? Why should I not be able to get into these trials? Open these trials up. Let people get in. Let people get in at different ages. Let people with different disease states. And then your data will be a lot more real when you get out of the trial phase. We'll and get a Dr. brief Kaufman, comment. If I, yeah. if I could ask this sure. question, because it yeah. goes directly with what you were just saying. This is from our audience. How can patients and advocates become involved earlier in these clinical trials you, so that they get the information that they know how they can get in? The question is, how can they get in early so that the clinical trials will, one, address real needs, two, be designed to remove barriers to participation, and three, have a better chance of completing accrual? So that's, I think, continuing on your thought there. Right. So the, the way, uh, the way to do this is to get involved with where the research is being done. And the research is generally being done in institutional settings or being done uh, pharma-driven. So pharma, to their credit, are starting to have chief patient officers and other things involved. But you know, we have to make sure that these people really have authority. Their, their say at the table is really heard. And the same at the institutional levels. A lot of the people that I know that are advocates at large institutions are just kind of nodding and saying whatever you say, doc. So we've got to make sure that we get the right patients in there doing this kind of thing. But if you're interested in that and you're involved in that, then you've got to knock on doors and rattle cages and try to get involved at the institutional settings where the research is being done and at the pharma where the research is being set up. Diane, any questions from Twitter? Well, just to follow up with you, um, this would be like contacting the uh, institutional review boards or find out who the offices of sponsored research, that sort of thing, to get involved with this at the IRB level. Right. So I, this is not my area of expertise mm -hmm. of how, how to do this, but I, you st start with your oncologist. I mean, start with 
uh, if it's, especially if it's at a uh, large institution, they're going to know who to talk to. Get them to help you, to introduce you, saying this would be a good person, you know, do those kinds of things so you get some connections. I mean, I try to lever my connections to get to the top researchers. To be able to sit at the table. Can I, yeah. can I, just, uh, can I just add for one minute, uh, I could not agree more, and I think patients are involved very early on. Uh, remember, patients are the heroes and inspiration for all that we do, all of us, no matter what we represent uh, in this room. And, so we're here to take care of each other, basically. And I will tell you that the patients are involved uh, on IRB levels at the institutional level. So they're looking at the protocols and deciding whether, in fact, this is a medical but also ethical uh, clinical trial in a certain context. So situations like was just mentioned uh, would not go forward. Um, they are involved in NIH committees, National Cancer Institute committees, FDA committees for uh, new drug approval, and uh, at many, many levels, uh, the patients are involved, and they really need to be for a variety of reasons, but the main one is to remind everyone else what we're really all here for, and, you know, to put down or aside the differences that might be there inevitably and make better collaboration for a common goal more quickly. So patients are involved very early. It's going to be even more important as we're going forward, as the costs of drugs get much more expensive, that we're going to have to really advocate for those that actually are very effective uh, and who can do that better than patients. So, can I, so I have a one the second part we want to bring up is that the cost of drugs. You know, if you look at the Peter Box model, and if you look at the, this is the, I don't know whether people are familiar with that. This is Peter Bach from Memorial Sloan Kettering is really onto this. And there is this cancer abacus uh, model. If you look at this, a striking finding is that if you look at the cost of the drug that is actually being charged, as opposed to the cost based on the value, it turns out that only 20% of the drugs that are being in the U.S. are either at or below the level, whereas in U.K., it's more like 60%. So if you use that model to price a drug, you will spend $5 billion less each year in the U.S. And if you use the U.K. model, if, you pay, if we all pay what the U.K. system pays, the cost, drug cost would come down by half. And the question is, what's holding us from doing this? Mike, you want to start off? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> well, you know, I think part of it is the uh, inelasticity of sort of drug pricing, meaning that in the world of cancer, uh, even a small incremental sort of uh, advance will justify a higher price point. Uh, the other thing, which I think is challenging, is um, sort of an unaffordable price point has already been set. So, for instance, if a current pretty good myeloma drug is $100,000 a year, what happens if CAR T is curative? You could say, well, if a pretty good drug can be $100,000 a year, then a curative drug should be several million dollars to get it once. And, and an economist, if, if that was the baseline, could argue that. I, I do think, and uh, to potentially challenge all of my esteemed speakers to the left, I think most of what they've commented on is how do you accelerate drug development? How do you make sure patients have access to great drugs? I actually think, ironically, that will increase the disparities in care because what will happen is, is as we speed up new drugs getting developed, um, the price point uh, of the newest drugs are going to get even broader than the price point of the older drugs and will make it even, uh, will increase financial toxicity. I think there are some very, very difficult things in, in this world that we haven't really wanted to talk about, but I think we do have to start thinking about. So how do we split risk? I mean, right now, most of the risk sits still on the shelf of the payer. And the payer gets a bad rap because prior authorizations and they, they pass a lot of costs on the patients, but they bear the giant part of risk. Should risk be split? And you could imagine providers taking more risk, manufacturers taking more risk. You could imagine patients taking more risk. If you don't have your colonoscopy on your 50th birthday, your insurance rates go up every year. 
If you cigarette smoke, your insurance rates go up every year. So you can imagine different risk models that begin to incentivize um, a broader stakeholder. You could imagine a model of patient autonomy. If it costs four times more to get your, breast, your early stage breast cancer treated at a large academic center versus in the community, um, perhaps you're not allowed to go to an academic center if you have a good prognosis cancer. Or perhaps your copay is different. Or perhaps you have to enroll in a randomized trial that flips a coin and dis determines whether you go to a low cost provider versus a high cost provider. We've talked a lot about how it's hard to compare data on, well, are the outcomes really better at place A versus place B? Is the incremental cost really justified? A randomized trial could answer that. But sort of thinking about could you do a randomized trial between site of care where patient autonomy was removed, these are things which right now would probably be considered fairly antithetical, but are the types of questions I think as a community we have to start asking. I think it's a perfect time to segue to the second segment, Denise, about the, what are the barriers that we have. You know, this is all kind of blending into each other, so I'll turn this over to Denise. Did you have a quick question there, Dr. Lyman? No, or it, quick? It's fine. They, you know, I, I think we're, 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 we've got to be honest about this. Uh, in a market-driven system, the price that's put on the drugs and allowed to be put on drugs is what the market will bear. Yes. And we have a community, uh, the recipients of these, who are desperate, they're, fright you know, they're facing the most serious, life-threatening situation in their life or their loved one's life, of course they're going to do everything they can, including, as you've heard, maybe uh, go mortgage their home, go into bankruptcy, or stop treatment. Um, they're desperate. So as long as we have a system that allows pricing to be based on what will be paid by the community, uh, there won't be an easy solution. There needs to be value-based pricing. We need to, to uh, despite uh, some apologies for the insurance companies, they're making huge profits off of the drugs that we order as physicians. We have middle managers like Express Scripts that are making billions of dollars with very little overhead. Um, the Economist just highlighted how these middlemen are accounting for about half of the profit on healthcare delivery for cancer care. Um, so we have a lot of places we can deal with this, but it's, uh, it's a political solution and you have to go and vote. Yeah, and, and you need to make uh, your concerns known at the ballot box. Okay. So our next question, we'll move on to our, our next uh, seg segment here. And why don't we start with Dr. Kaufman and then move down the line that way, if that's okay. So what, I, what we really want to know are what are the most important barriers that you believe individually that are keeping you from getting your job done or from doing it as well as you could? Just individual barriers that you face. So individual barriers in terms of lowering the, the costs? Or? In terms of whatever you think you need to do best to work with your patients and get them the care that they need at a price they can afford. All right. So I'm, I'm the absolute, I'm in the antithetical poster boy for expensive care. I've had a bone marrow transplant. I've been on uh, a breakthrough medication in a clinical trial for seven years, uh, PCI through 2765, now known as Ibrutinib or Imbruvica, which is now over $130,000 a year. I've been on it for seven years. And I just had CAR T therapy, and I just was discharged from the clinic Friday, two days ago. So you, I, I am probably the worst person to talk, because what I do is advocate, and when I work as a patient advocate, I try to get, and I'm sure every doctor here tries to get the absolute best care that they can for their patient in front of them. And later, we think about the community of the thousands and thousands of patients that we have. But I go through all means I can to try to get my insurance to pay for things and to, uh, you know, I have, a, I have a case manager because I'm so darn expensive uh, of a patient and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, I'm the worst person uh, to talk about that. But when I make decisions about this, and this is the one thing I would talk to um, my, my when I talk with patients about this, is, and I'm not an oncologist, I'm a family doc, 
you talk to them about the risk-benefit ratios, about what's going on, you talk to them about the costs, and now I think some that financial toxicities is part of that risk-benefit ratios. And you have to have these hard talks with patients in terms of what they want to do, in terms of making a decision about what therapies they're, they're going to move forward with. You know, our, it, it's interesting, there's things that we found, for example, that patients aren't particularly concerned about the immediate side effects of medications. They don't care about the vomiting, the hair loss, that's relatively minor. What they're carried about is the long term. Am I going to get a secondary cancer? Or am I going to get a fatal infection? And am I going to be immune suppressed for the rest of my life? These kinds of things. Am I going to have heart problems from the medicines that I take? These things that they have to live with forever are much more of an issue for the patient and stuff. There's also a tremendous bias with patients against chemotherapy, and most chemotherapy is relatively inexpensive, and a lot of it works great for patients, but patients don't want it. They want the new, sighting, sexy, you know, targeted therapies, and that's the course that I took, too, and a lot of other patients follow that course. So we've got to talk to people and say, hey, there's still a role for some low-cost therapies that work great. Go ahead, Dr. Lyman. So, uh, of course, again, I agree with all that. I, I think it starts with the conversation, uh, with establishing the goals of care, um, what the, uh, informing the patient about what the options are, what the potential benefits and harms for each of these are. Uh, uh, that includes the cost uh, side of this. Uh, and, and then lay out uh, a plan, but at each point in time, at each visit, update where they are and, and, and whether those options remain viable uh, or not. I think. Uh, in the larger practices, certainly in the health systems, having a financial navigator, someone, uh, these, this isn't the expertise of those of us up here. Uh, it may become by, <laughs> by, you know, by the trials that you face, but uh, we're not trained in the, the economics of healthcare delivery. Um, but, and, and it's a time issue. You have so little time to spend with the patient, but there are, resources, at least again in the larger practices and health systems, people who can meet with the patient, help them understand what the cost implications are uh, of the, 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 the treatments or the diagnostics that are being recommended. Uh, so I, I think again it begins and, and ends with the conversation. And that includes end of life care. That includes when you get to the point where the remaining strategies are extremely limited, likely to cause more harm than good, having that honest conversation. That's again not what we were trained to do. Uh, we were trained to cure, to treat, uh, and, and we never like to say uh, uh, enough uh, that we were giving up. And then we don't, of course. There's so much we can do in terms of symptom control, managing side effects, and so forth. But uh, it, having that honest discussion so the patient and the family in a shared fashion can make the decision that's right for them. Great, so um, I have spent my career uh, trying to do two things, make science count for patients, do research that improves the diagnosis, prognosis, or treatment of cancer, and number two, treat patients as family. So number one, it's like awesome. Unprecedented progress for all of us, up unprecedented opportunities. If you're an oncologist, it's been transformative, and the opportunity to do something good for your patients is amazing. What about the second part, treating patients as family? Honestly, that's getting harder and harder and harder because of what I will call administrative uh, issues. For example, nowadays when a patient needs to get treated with a particular novel agent and it doesn't happen to be on uh, the nccn guidelines or in another place they actually need to go through a process where they actually sign at our institution that they'll be responsible for paying for that agent prior to actually getting treated and it can delay treatment and i don't think it's unique to our institution <laughs> And this is a totally inappropriate additional stress to put on patients, especially if it's justified. And so we have a whole new cadre of people whose job it is to figure out how the thing can get covered, which can take weeks, and in fact, uh, usually ends up to be positive, but it's a terribly inefficient system for treatment. People who are making the decisions to approve it or not are actually not informed about the particular disease and or treatment. 
Um, the second thing is the electronic medical record. Oh my. Uh, but in any event, we have this electronic medical record, which in fact is built for billing and not for patient care. And doctors and, sorry. And so those people who do clinical oncology have, are, have incredible stress now, burnout is high, and there's no evidence, at least in my view yet, that the quality of care that is being delivered and the patient outcome actually correlates with the use of these new electronic medical records. Instead, you're judged upon how many level four and fives you do, et cetera, et cetera. And I think the administrative burden is really too high. We need to work together to decrease it so we can treat patients as family. Yeah, I, I would uh, just add that um, the system is, is uh, so complicated, it is going to take some rather draconian efforts, I think, to uh, change things. I, I would echo uh, Dr. Anderson's comment on the electronic health records, which in, in a medium-sized institution is a, often a $100 million investment, can only get justified at the level of the CFO if they say, look, this is going to be improved billing, improved collections. Um, this will pay for itself over the next 10 years. It's a worthwhile investment. The, the other thing I would mention, um, and nobody is innocent, and the, the one thing I would say is, you know, when I sit in these debates, uh, I'll have people say, oh, it's the PBMs, oh, it's the manufacturers, oh, it's the middlemen. I would say no one is innocent in this uh, game. And one of the challenges that compounds things is aggregation. And whether it's healthcare systems buying up community hospitals, provider networks getting larger, I include US oncology in that cadre, whether it includes drug companies buying up competitor molecules or coming up with deals that competitor molecules don't launch for an extra year or two, PBMs buying PBMs, payers buying P uh, uh, PBMs, CVS buying that. Now, all of these aggregation strategies all lead to increases in healthcare costs. And, uh, and what happens is if the payers are aggregating, the providers say, well, we better aggregate or we're, we're doomed. And everyone feels they have to continue to aggregate until we come up with really, as I mentioned, draconian solutions to slow this down. Uh, we're very vulnerable to increasing healthcare. I have a question before that, Brian, you go. You had, you had to say something. Yeah, just, just echoing that, I think uh, we've seen a move from therapy delivered in doctors' offices to the hospital where the costs are much higher. We talked a little bit about this over dinner last night that there's charges for just kind of walking in the room, the facility charges and stuff, that no clinic ever charge, no personal private clinic ever charges. So, and there's no transparency of that. I mean, when you get a bill from me, it's complicated, but you can kind of figure it out. But if I get a bill from the hospital, you can't figure it out at all. So I agree, there's blame to spread around everywhere in this move to aggregation, in this move to this integrated healthcare system, which is supposed to control costs, is just really increased costs because everything's more expensive to do in the hospital than outpatient. So, you know, I want, to, I want to bring up one point. You know, I think it was Yogi Berra who said, everybody is complaining about weather, but nobody is doing anything about it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this is very relevant to this, too. If you think about it, we are all conflicted, you know, as physicians, as drug developers, industry, as academic institution, private practices, and, you know, we and are... And patients. And, in a way, patients, too, because you want more and more therapies, you want the best tests, you want... Even if it's a one-person chance, people <laughs> tell me that I want to try it because it's very desperate. So, in this situation, we recognize that the drug development is flawed, the drug costs are prohibitively expensive because you cannot talk to them, you cannot negotiate, and we don't see political will, either from the left or the right, to address this issue. So we can keep doing all this. We have this discussion conference. It's wonderful. We get charged, and we go back on Monday morning. Everything is the same thing. So what is going to change this? What do we need to do to really first, I would think, to me, is you know, limiting the ineffective clinical trials and negotiating the drug price? So what would it take to have this political will and have this conversation going? I don't even see the conversation going in the political yeah, you know, I think, um, I think it is ultimately going to come from um, people, not from patients, but people. 
you know, I think um, as long as we keep talking about it but kicking the can down the road, somewhere between 10 and 20 years from now, we'll have a Department of Defense and Medicare and n no other money in the federal budget. And um, education won't get any money, highways won't get any money, that's it. You know, if you're a soldier or you're, you know, in the office of Medicare, you'll have money and that's it. And I do think sooner or later, um, the public will demand an answer. Uh, I think the question's going to be, what is that answer? Um, I do believe it is going to have to involve a form of rationing. Um, and how exactly that works, uh, I'm not that smart, but I do believe, much like in some countries, if you're above a certain age, you're not getting dialysis. Whether it's if this only has a limited chance of working, you're not going to get it or you're going to have to pay for it out of your own pocket. I do worry it will broaden care disparity even further between the ultra rich and the sort of middle class, uh, let alone the people who have limited health insurance. But I do think it is going to take um, even more of a crisis in the healthcare delivery system. Uh, and the fact that bankruptcies are going up, listening to the advocacy group, this crisis has begun. And uh, the temperature is going to have to get a little bit higher. Uh, but then I think something that currently is unthinkable uh, will happen. And whether that's cost control, capitated costs, some, something that right now is a discussion we can't really have, eventually we're going to have to have. I've got a quick follow-up. So when you talk about rationing, are you talking about rationing of care for patients, or are you talking about rationing of profiteering off of patients? So I think, I think uh, it's going to be a, a, what I would call a broad swath of rationing. So I think it is going to be rationing for care patients can get. I think it is going to be rationing on, um, you know, whether it's rationing on you know, what kind of prices you can charge for therapies based on some metric that still has not been ideally defined, whether it's um, thinking about um, whether we have a single payer system uh, and say, look, health insurance companies are making too much money, so we're going to have a single payer system. You could imagine a system where um, if somebody developed a life-saving drug uh, the federal government would pass a law where the federal government can buy that drug uh, and its intellectual property and charge a fair price for the public good. I mean, these would all be things where you'd say, oh, that, could, that could never, that would be so anti-American. But I do think if the rules of the game persist in broad strokes, things are going to get worse until something dramatically different happens. I just, uh, I, I agree that it begins with the patient. Yeah, yeah. Everybody else in this network of interactions we're talking about has a perverse incentive, potentially, uh, and except the patient. Uh, and they simply want the best treatment and to live and to have a quality survival. Um, I think this begins with transparency. I, frankly, I think patients don't know the differences between different treatments. They don't know the differences in cost. Frankly, the doctors don't know what they're ordering costs most of the time, unless they take a great deal of effort to, to, to explore that and uh, dig it out. And even then, what the cost is to the individual patient when it comes to out-of-pocket, uh, co-pays, uh, uh, agreements that have been worked out with insurers. Um, we need transparency. We need to know at each step in the process what the economic impact is of the decisions that we make, and the patients need to know what the impact is to them individually. Then I think, again, to the ballot box, make it insist that changes take place. Uh, the solution, I don't, I don't like to use the R word, um, the rationing side, be, until we have explored every opportunity to bring sanity to the pricing and, and the decision making that's uh, taking place at the patient level. Yeah, I just want to echo what both of them have said. I do think there's plenty of room for improvement in this system at all levels. So firstly, in the cost of drug development, uh, it pays for all of the failures. 
the companies spend, uh, nine out of 10 companies spend much more on marketing than they do on research. All these costs are put into the cost of a drug. Get um, rid of direct-to-consumer advertising. There we go. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, and I also think that you know there should be negotiation by um, our government for the cost of drugs like there is in every other country around the world. Uh, and we are the biggest purchaser, the government, of drugs. Um, I, I think uh, in, at the level of the uh, providers, uh, doctors, and administrators in the institutional settings, there's plenty of room, as I alluded to before, for improvement in the cost. Ultimately, what I think is we have to have outcomes-based medicine. And I'm a little bit different than Michael. Maybe I'm inappropriately optimistic because I am a Red Sox fan still. <laughs> but, uh, but the point is, what, what, where we are now, we have high costs and poor access, right? We want to be opposite to that. We want high access and lower costs. So the question is, can we get there? And I think if we reduce the cost for drug development, reduce the cost of administration, and I should add, I've been told that about 30% of the cost of health care is now being spent to regulate the cost of health care. What other business? If you had a used car salesman you know, operation, and you spent 30 to 40% of it on regulating the cost of running the business, you would go out of business, and that's what's going to happen. But in any event, I think if we have outcomes-based medicine, and in the future, you've heard Gary mention, you know, the registry concept where we can, when a patient comes in to see us and he says, you know, I have this certain disease, we can look at the registry and say, well, this is what, what your course is likely to be like at this particular time of year and we're going to, or time in the, in the world, and we're going to treat you with this regimen, which is much more likely to work. The cost will inevitably go down, but I hope it may be that we're going to have to do rationing, but my sincerest hope is if, in fact, everyone who could benefit from an agent or treatment gets the treatment, then everybody will be happy. The profits will be up for the companies, the caregivers, and most importantly, the patients Michael, will be Michael, can I quickly satisfied. clarify? I, maybe we should be careful in our choice of words when the debate gets really national. It, the way I see it is it's not ra rationing as much as avoiding ineffective or very low of, you know, benefit therapies. And that's what you're trying to keep yeah. that away yeah. from the sharing the cost. So it's not like somebody has, can benefit from a drug, you say you're not gonna get it. It is the drug that has a 1% chance of working. You cannot have the system pay for it. You know, in other words, these are marginal to ineffective therapies. And uh, there is a notion that more therapy is better, even in the terminal stages, that I think is false. And we physicians sometimes perpetuate that inadvertently, and we've got to be careful about that. Can I say, I'm, I'm not sure, I agree with what you just said, but I'll mention CAR T cells, and we have a world's expert at CAR T cells having just had it <laughs> very, very recently and here already. Um, but if you all saw the New York Times, there was an article that said a million dollar treatment for CAR T cells, who's going to pay for it? Right. So I think, I take your point about rationing, but I really think the rationing, as I think Michael may have meant, you know, who is going to pay? Let's say that this is a really effective treatment, and it is a million dollars. It's three or $400,000 for the product, and then you have to add the cost of it administering in the hospital, et cetera. Um, but, you know, that kind of thing could, unfortunately, lead to limiting access to treatments, even if it's very effective. Right. So, so I think um, whether we call it rationing or rational, um, but there is, if you kind of survey all of oncology, there is an awful lot of therapy given with palliative intent where, um, and these, ex these therapies are extraordinarily expensive. There might be reasonably good evidence that they can add a couple of months of life or, or some symptom-free uh, time. And I'm not suggesting for an individual that isn't important. And, and I, I want to say that, you know, I, uh, when I am in the clinic, I am taking care of people with ovarian cancer, and many of those people get four, five, six, seven, eight different treatment courses uh, during their life. But um, I do believe that eventually the system just doesn't have any more money in it. And the question then becomes, um, how do you spend dollars? And um, do you spend, and 
we're talking about a very narrow part of healthcare right now, cancer, but do you, do you make sure everyone gets HPV vaccines or do you make sure people get an eighth line of chemotherapy? And right now the answer to that question is yes. Everyone should get HPV vaccines and everyone should have the right to get an eighth line of chemotherapy. I just do believe that sooner or later the system will not afford that. Um, and, um, you know, now if the patient wants it, we go through unbelievable, you know, efforts mm -hmm. to try to figure out how to get that to the patients. And I think eventually that's going to be challenging. And, and I think we have to start with the patient expectations. You know, I have CLL, it's an incurable cancer, maybe CAR T, maybe an aloe transplant, but essentially, so all care I get is palliative. So you've got to set those expectations and say, you know, what's going on, what's here. So I have to have realistic views. You have to have those realistic conversations. That's where it starts with the patients. We've talked about that. We have to have, have transparency. We have to use models that are less expensive. Not only get rid of all the lawyers, simplify the EMR, but maybe get rid of, you know, three quarters of the suits. I mean, you know, each family doctor, I'm a family doc, I know that business. We support between seven and ten staff, most of which aren't clinical staff, most of which are billing and administrative staff. I mean, I'm the only one who's delivering any care, who's creating any billing, you know, but I'm supporting seven to ten people as a family doc, and I bet the numbers are similar as oncologists. So we've got to get rid of all that fluff that we have there to do this. But I think the big change is not going to come from these incremental things. I think, I, I, I also think that the drug development can be lowered a lot. I think all this stuff about how much it costs a drug to get to a market can be radically changed. Um, I think that the uh, direct-to-consumer advertising is a big issue. 30 to 40 percent of pharmaceutical companies' budgets are spent on this area. I think that we had all kinds of drug development in the 70s and 80s when we didn't have these radical um, uh, price rises in the medications. But I really think the big change, and I agree with Mike, isn't going to come from the people up here. It's going to come from the people outside. It's going to come from the millennials and the people following the millennials saying, I'm sick and tired of paying for this. You know. You know, I want a road to drive on that doesn't have, you know, um, you know, all these potholes. I, I want, you know, other things going on. We can't be spending all the money on Dr. Kaufman and his expensive care for his CLL. I mean, the, these are things that have to come. So I think the change is going to come from outside unless we have the guts to sort of put all the pieces together and start to make those changes and bend that curve down. Otherwise, outside forces are going to do it to us. That's why I say a tsunami is coming and we better be prepared for it. For the, the, my one sort of punctuation point on the power of the public, if you consider Wall Street um, at least a bit of a microcosm of what the public is thinking, look at what happens to all of the big healthcare players every time, and this is a very Seattle specific example, Amazon and healthcare are in the same sentence. Um, every time Amazon and healthcare are in the same sentence, basically anyone who's in the for-profit healthcare business, their stock drops and the market cap disappears by billions of dollars within hours. And part of that is the American public is so sensitized to this is a system that needs to be disrupted. Now, it's not quite clear how Amazon would disrupt it, but um, it almost generates, you know, a little bit of a <gasps> um, thinking about what would a totally different healthcare delivery system look like? So before we are running, slowly running out of time. So very quickly, in a couple of minutes, do you want to address the issue of cost of tests and hospitalizations, costs, and what we can do to cut this down, and then and then we move on to the final segment. I'll I'll start out. I'm sure everybody has some opinion on this. Uh, and I, obviously, it was highlighted earlier that locally, regionally. This is an area that we've been particularly focused on because our studies have indicated considerable overuse of tests, uh, overuse of hospitals uh, for managing symptoms that probably could be managed in other ways. So uh, actually uh, partnering with providers, patients, health systems to look, measure, uh, find out what's being used appropriately, what is being overused, uh, which obviously drives healthcare costs. Uh, and, and come together and say, let's, uh, let's look at the problem, let's see how big it is, let's see uh, what can be done to uh, rein in overuse of testing or other uh, expensive modalities. So, uh, you know, I think that's, that's a part of this equation. 
Uh, it can, you know, and over, over testing isn't just a cost issue, it has harms to patients. Uh, it may lead to biopsies or over treatment of patients. Uh, it may uh, expose them to radiation needlessly uh, if it's not an appropriate use. So there are many reasons health-wise, in addition to financially, not to do things that are not recommended. Guidelines, pathways, and uh, projects like Choosing Wisely that have been embraced throughout the medical profession to say here are things that we do for which there's no evidence they do any good. They may cause harm. They certainly drive up costs. Let's all agree those are things we should not routinely done. There'll always be an exception. There'll always be a patient that doesn't fit and, and should get a, a test done, particularly around symptoms. Uh, but the vast majority don't need all these things done. And we as a profession, in the conversation with the patient, uh, should agree from the beginning, we're not going to do needless, potentially harmful things uh, to patients while we do the best we can uh, to improve their long-term outcomes. So um, it really is a topsy-turvy kind of world that we're dealing with as cancer patients and, and, and caregivers. And we've talked a lot about the high cost of these new therapies, these bright, shiny new therapies that are advertised on TV that everybody wants, even though it might not be the correct therapy for them. We've talked about um, the high cost of some of these tests and procedures, but this um, statistic you're talking about with regard to the, the, the middlemen and the uh, bureaucracy, what on earth can we do to, to reduce that? And Brian, at dinner the other night, you were talking about you know your insurance issues and um, you know inefficiencies and and you know you're getting bills you shouldn't be getting and and Gary, you talked about the need for financial navigators. I mean, why? What can we do to get through these very cluttered, confusing, costly, bureaucratic waters that would be more efficient? What are you know what are some um, disruptive? Well, I think we have to bang some heads at all different levels. We have to bang heads at the levels of the providers, the bang levels at the institutions and the hospitals, and bang heads at the levels of the payers. So it's all the same. I mean, it's, it's unbelievably different if you have one insurance versus another insurance, if you're this hospital versus that hospital. I think if we had one kind of simple kind of system, um, so you know, and uh, you know, I, I'm dual citizen. I'm, I, I, you know, I grew up in the Canadian healthcare system and practiced medicine there. And I mean, billing was like nothing. I mean, it was. I mean, I didn't have any staff. I mean, I sent in a bill, and I got paid. I didn't get paid as much as you get paid here, but I always got paid, and I just did it myself. That there was nothing to it, and that's the way most docs do it in Canada. So we have to have this huge staff to do all of the stuff. So I think we have to bang heads, but. It's not just Canada. It's most of the developed world functions on health systems uh, of either a single payer or predominantly a single payer by which patients get high quality care. Uh, it's not true of the developing world, but the developed world has gone leaps ahead of where we are. So yes, it would be extremely disruptive to many in our uh, communities perhaps, but a single health payer system, at least as an option uh, to provide uh, equally effective and cost-effective care uh, is the ultimate solution and, and would get rid of much of that middleman, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, pharmacy benefit managers, the, even some, a lot of the insurance uh, managers where the big profits are being made in today's environment. Yeah, I, I would echo that. I, I do think that um, I've already mentioned the administration, but we have new levels of people that are regulating the cost of health care. We have new scribes that have now been hired, a whole new layer of, that need to be paid because of electronic medical records, okay? And I can go on and on, but I think there's plenty of room to decrease it. But I do think we really need to think about where was it actually decided that that we can um, make huge profits by limiting access to health care. I mean, I understand you need to do things responsibly. That's not the issue. I, I'm totally, I got that. But I think that, you know, um, 
I've had to deal with so many things over the years where I've had to, you know, to argue or talk to people in uh, one insurance company or another and eventually get to the medical director and say, if this were you, would you want to get treated this way? And uniformly they say yes. And then I say, well, you forgot you're a doctor, so let's go, right? Let's treat this patient the way you would want to be treated. And I, I really think we, and I'm not, I'm, I think we need to work together. This was not uh, meant to be ultimately negative, but the point is we can make a more efficient system. We really can. We can get the drugs better. We can get rid of this. The VA health system, I know it has problems apparently with a new director, but, uh, but uh, it has a dynamite medical record system. We could have gotten that as a country for nothing and put it in our institutions, and we didn't do it. And we are paying a price for that right now. There's lots of ways we could improve the getting the medicines, administration of the medicines, and recording, and ultimately um, making it less stressful for caregivers and patients alike. Caregivers, this should not be minimized. Clinical oncology, you know, caregivers now have a burnout rate that is really high. And, you know, even though it's the fun part of medicine and even though it's an unprecedented time of progress, the stresses versus the opportunity, and most went into it because of the passion to do it, is really tilting in the wrong direction. I think in the short term there is some opportunity for transparency um, down to the consumer level in that, uh, you know, the cost of CAT scans or MRIs are dramatically different in one place versus the other. If you need an endoscopy or a bronchoscopy uh, in a surgery center, the difference between getting it done in a hospital and a surgery center might be 300 percent different. Um, there is not probably 300 percent difference in an endoscopy in a surgery center versus in a hospital setting. So I do, th and there are, there are companies, companies like Castlight and others, which you can go online and look to see how much does it cost to get my knee MRI here versus there. So I think th there are um, costs between urgent care and emergency rooms. So I think there is some low-lying fruit, um, and as consumers pay more and more of the health care bill, I think part of the challenge in cancer is there's so much going through your brain in a short period of time that, you know, if the doctor says, look, I'll take care of it, get, get your scan here, do this, do this, do this, do this, here's a menu. Um, you know, your first reflex is just to go do it where they said to do it versus, you know, cost shopping. But um, as more of the costs shift the patients, I think there is at least an opportunity to make some headway there. I, I, I would like to pose this question to all of you. You've all presented some wonderful ideas on how things can change. Fewer suits, you know, the regulation, financial navigators, although that may, in my mind, add to the cost because you're adding to the staff, you want to reduce staff. But really, it, it definitely takes action without a doubt. We could debate you know, all of this for hours or days or weeks or months. What can each person in this room do? Do you believe what each person in this room could do as a tipping point to actually make change and project change to a better solution down the road? Lower costs. How can we, as an individual, help lower the cost? Um, you know, I think for individuals, if people, th there has been a discussion about consumer-driven health care, meaning as consumers have to cover more and more of their health care costs, they will begin choosing wisely, just like you choose wisely for buying a car. If you actually look now and say, is that happening in health care now? The answer is, for the most part, no, it is not happening now. Uh, if the world really realized that, holy smokes, consumers are shopping very aggressively about where to get their CT scan or their MRI, and no one's coming here anymore because we're three times more expensive than everyone else, prices will come down. Yeah, I do, I do agree with that. I think competition ultimately will bring the uh, prices down, and I do think that, that medicine is actually one of the few areas where there really isn't any connection between the person who needs health care and what is actually paid. And the persons in the middle, caregivers, doctors, and others, don't actually have a clue about how much is actually being done. It, it really needs to be much more transparent, to use somebody's word here. 
But I think what you asked, what can we all do? I think it, it needs to be um, changed at a political level. Uh, and I think that um, the two short-term things, I think, are, are advocating, in my view, for the ability of the government to negotiate for the price, of the uh, cost of drugs. That would bring drugs down costs uh, uh, tremendously because, it, as we've all said, it, the government is the biggest purchaser of drugs uh, on planet Earth. And number two, some form of um, some advocate for, if not universal or a single payer, but some more efficient system to cut down on the administrative costs. If if we don't, as as uh, you've said, you know, uh, Armageddon is coming or tsunami is coming, whatever the word was. But we ought to do this ourselves rather than have some draconian uh, solution uh, dropped upon us. Again, to agree with everything that's said, we need a consumer reports for health care so that patients can be informed, they can choose, they can discuss with their physician the pros and cons, but they need knowledge, they need to be informed. Uh, and then we need to go to the ballot boxes, as I've said a couple of times, uh, to express our concern about the health care system as it currently exists and vote for those that are interested in bringing a more fair, equitable, uh, and universal access uh, to everyone in need of health care delivery, which is the entire population, and certainly to cancer care uh, patients and survivors uh, to uh, be sure uh, everyone gets the quality of care they deserve, they need, uh, and then we uh, should expect uh, uh, as uh, citizens of, the, of this country. In medicine and in primary care, we've been very good at overcoming set taboos. So there was a time when I practiced when people wouldn't talk about sexual issues and stuff to their family doc, but now that's completely wide open on the table. It's not an issue. People talk to me about that. But there's one taboo that remains, and that's financial issues. And you think I, as a patient, am going to say to the doc, so what's that going to cost, even if I'm not paying for it, even if the CAT scan is covered by my insurance, am I just being an annoying? Or is my doc going to turn around to me and say, well, we do the CAT scan, it's this. If we do it here, it's that, you know? I mean, we've got to remove the taboo about talking about financial stuff. Patients have to initiate asking about stuff, even if it's not coming out of their pocket. They have to know what things are costing. I think that that's got to be part of what's going on, just like you explained the side effects. And just like, you know, I think that the top doctors are now talking about the financial toxicities. We got to know not just the financial toxicities of the drugs, but of all the different treatment parts, all the workups. I mean, some of these tests are thousands and thousands of dollars to, to uh, look for the specifics of what the genetic abnormalities are. So we've got to start doing that. And then the doctors, the providers have to be talking to people about some of this stuff in terms of saying this is what things cost. I think that that's one small step we can take that'll help get the discussion out there. And because all of us are essentially patients at some point, I think that's a way to get it out, like Michael talks, out to the people, where if that financial discussion is there and people are knowing what things are costing in, in real time, I think that that'll start to create some of the political will. Well, this is Seattle, so we should be able to find some app developer to come up with that uh, <laughs> consumer cancer report. I just Did you have one, something to add? Could I add one quick comment? Um, I do, I want to totally echo his comments, but I do want to say, when I see a new patient and I talk to them and I say, you're going to get, you're going to need to get two or three new medicines together and it's going to cost 30,000 or some such large number per each month. And I say, and they say, oh, that's okay, I don't have to pay anything, or my copay is $50. And I look at them and I said, well, somebody's paying for this. Right. So there has to be some responsibility, and maybe that isn't the right word, but accountability. There, there, you know, we are responsible for our own health. So there needs to be a balance here in terms of, surely the costs need to come down, but people also really need to be aware of what actually benefits they're getting. And some patients are saying, they assume they're, you know, this is, uh, they're entitled, they're gonna get this medicine. Um, I think there's a real imbalance there, at least in some cases. Yeah. You know, Binay told us, told me, I, we can take 10 more minutes to ask some questions from the audience, and uh, if it's okay with you too. So, 
So I had a question, and I thought, you know, I think of as a cancer doctor, what are the big issues that come up? And one of the things is most patients don't even know where to begin with questions. And there's a TV commercial where this very well-to-do couple are meeting with a financial analyst. And before they meet with him, they go to buy a Lamborghini, and they're kicking the tires, and they're asking questions. They look at something else like a condominium, and they want to know what the tax implications are. And then they go to the financial analyst, and they're kind of like deers in the headlight. And one of the things I think that could be most important for a patient is to bring someone with them that can actually listen to, see, to what's going on and be the advocate or ask questions at the time. The issue about financial toxicity is huge, but we doctors don't have a clue. And I'll give a good example. Um, denosumab was just approved as an alternative to Zometa. And I went around my clinic and I asked our docs, how many of you use denosumab? It was actually a surprisingly large number. And they said, well, it's sub-Q. It doesn't affect renal function. Then I asked our pharmacist, what was the difference in price? It was an eight-fold difference. And I was absolutely blown away. So the one doc who said, I use it because it's sub-Q, had no clue. Of course, when he knew that, he changed his pattern. But those are really challenging things. And then I'll throw out one last thing, and that was Atul Gawande did a PBS uh, Frontline special, and it was really compelling. It was based on his book on being mortal. And it showed him talking to the husband of a patient who had had lung cancer shortly after she had become pregnant. And this woman went through probably seven different lines of chemotherapy. And as she was coming to the end of her life, he ended up recommending a clinical trial to her. And years later, when he talked to the husband, and they had this face-to-face, -face incredibly powerful meeting you know, for the PBS cameras, he said, you know, I didn't know how to tell you that there was no chance in the world that that clinical trial was going to work. But it was easier for me to say that at the time. I didn't have the vocabulary to say that this is where we need palliative care. And so when we talk about, you know, enrollment, you know, ASCO's doing a lot of things. Palliative care is now being pushed to the front line, not the back line. Our medical students are being taught how to engage patients, although the medical record and the the time we have to actually have those real conversations is challenging. But as patients, I think bringing, bringing someone in who can advocate for you, that's particularly true in the hospital where things go really, really fast, and it's the squeaky wheel that gets the attention, would be some of the suggestions I would make. So I think there's some data that suggests honorary patients, the angry honorary patients, live longer than the compliant nice patients. <laughs> so uh, I, I think pushing back, I, you know, one of the things that I talk with patient groups about always is you know, bring somebody with you. And if you can't bring somebody with you, bring a tape recorder with you. My wife and I walk out of meetings. I'm a physician. I should know. We have entirely different takes on what the doctor said, entirely different takes when we listen to the tape and we, we, we sort it out. So I, I, I think that, that that's part of it. Another thing that you know, I push at as a patient advocate in LLS and other people do this is to be an educated patient. And you know, it's, it really concerns me when I saw the prostate data in terms of the workup and stuff there, because I expect that in CLL. I mean, when I was diagnosed with CLL, I got a PET scan, didn't need it, got a bone marrow biopsy, didn't need it, got a CAT scan, didn't need it. That's just what was done in the community. Almost everybody gets that. But they don't see that much. CLL is an orphan disease. So I expect that, and so we push people to get expert access, and sometimes the expert access is actually cheaper. It's more expensive to see the doc, but it's cheaper because they're not ordering CAT scans and bone marrow biopsies and other things like that. They're following the guidelines or they're going along that. But it concerns me when, you know, one of the big four cancers is also being over-diagnosed, over-treated, over-managed and stuff like that. So I expected it with CLL. I expect it with an orphan disease where the community hemocologists, bless them, don't have that much experience with it. But um, this, you know, it concerns me to see that it's out with the big four. Yeah. Um, I just want to piggyback what you just said and let you know that Family Reach was part of Joe Biden's Cancer Moonshot Initiative. And we were challenged and charged with getting to the patient early, exactly what you said. So we are now piloting the Financial Treatment Initiative at a few hospitals. One is Tufts in Boston, where when a patient is first diagnosed, they get this very quick, by the social worker, a financial risk assessment. And it's 13 questions. It helps us understand the financial makeup. They know the cancer type. They know what they're in for. 
Um, they're getting a financial handbook that was put together by patients and caregivers, for patients and caregivers. It's starting the conversation. Then they're given a pro bono certified financial planner that goes through a family reach training module. So the family gets a financial planner that allows them to take a look at where they are financially now and help them plan for what they're in for. We did that because some of the social workers who that is who the patient is talking to about these financial crises, they are not trained to handle financial issues. They're trained on the psychosocial. So some of the advice that families were getting was just atrocious, like get divorced, one of you files bankruptcy, one of you keeps their credit, don't pay your mortgage, it'll take them a long time to kick you out. So we will be measuring the impact of what happens when you do start these conversations early um, and often, so every three months they're visited um, to see where they stand because it's, I've had cancer and you're not hearing anything in the beginning, you're certainly not thinking about your finances. So we'll also be studying at what point are they ready and willing to talk about their finances and some interventions. And I also want to piggyback what you just said. I had the opportunity um, a couple of weeks ago to shadow a pediatric oncologist on her rounds. And I saw an entirely different um, situation than she did. The first, and I'll only tell you one, um, but we went into a, a little boy who was six years old. He had Down syndrome. He was fighting brain cancer since he was four. He's, he'd been through brain surgeries, chemotherapy that almost killed him, um, and radiation. And we had to go in and tell these parents that the tumor is growing. And so when we went in, the little boy was sitting on his dad's lap, squirming, and the mother said, I'm sorry, he, we've been up since four. We left the, the house at four because we're five hours away. Um, and then the doctor said he needs another surgery. You have to go talk to the surgical team. And the mother said, I have two kids to pick up at the bus at 2.30. The doctor's not hearing any of this, right? The doctor is focused on curing that little boy. Then the father says, when is this surgery? And she said, within the next two weeks. And he said, I'm out of vacation. I, I don't know how we're going to do this. So when we walked out of that room, I said to the doctor, there's, there's so little chance that that little boy is coming back for this surgery. And she was like, what are you talking about? Why? And so when I explained what I saw, um, it's just, again, not focused. So it's almost like the patient needs to have somebody there to listen, but so does the doctor. Because there's a whole subset of, of situations going on. And I'll tell you, I learned yesterday, he didn't come back. That boy did not come back because the parents just couldn't get him there. So it goes on both sides. Yeah. That's thanks. That's a very moving story. And it's so, so tragic. It happens all the time. So one last question, and if you can... Uh, Ask this question keep, in a keep minute it short. or less. <laughs> yeah, that'll be great. Okay, this is Thank kind you. of piggybacking on the other things, but I'd like to hear what the panel thinks about this. Um, one of the issues that were addressed by both of the preceding questions was um, how do you have good conversations between the patients and their doctors about what's important to the patient and what's realistic in their care? How can we train providers to do goals of care conversations with their patients and give them time they can build to do that, and how do we train the patients to tell the doctors what's important to them? So I'll just mention quickly and start, but I, I think that uh, I've already mentioned the electronic medical record and how, in my opinion, that has interfered with the patient-caregiver interaction. If, we, if uh, we did it correctly, we would put the computer between us and the patient, and we would be looking at the computer and every once in a while looking up at the patient <laughs> and making sure that we press wrap up and send that bill before the patient leaves the room. It's totally, totally unacceptable. Um, but what I would say in just one short answer sentence to your answer to your question, when we were trained in medicine, you know, we were told, you know, don't talk as though you were the patient. That's preposterous. You're not the patient. You, you couldn't possibly know what it's like to go through their situation. I actually think it's completely the other way around. Because we, when we see in a tertiary setting patients come in, we give them all of this data. And I know in some places then the doctor will say or the caregiver will say, well, wh what would you like to do to the patient? Like what ordering from a menu, right? the other way around. We talk about all the information. We try to inform them as best we can. And I always look them in the eye and say, 
if I were you, this is what I would do. Because that's what patients expect of us. That's why they're coming to us. And if you can't recommend a therapy for you or your wife or your loved one, then you shouldn't be thinking about it for another patient too. On the other side, patients being proactive, I, in my experience, that uh, is, it's a tertiary setting, but they're quite proactive. They often come in with a list of their genes and honestly, uh, with what tra treatment they really want. And so I, I take that in a, in a small subset of patients, but I do think we need to train patients or encourage patients with foundation and other levels to be proactive in their care, given the complexities of the system. And, and LLS and other organizations have done great work in terms of what questions to ask when you're there. And of course, the classic question, you know, uh, patients are, are taught to ask is if this is your sister, if this is your brother, if this is your mom or dad, what would you recommend? I think all doctors kind of expect that um, to be there. But there's kind of lists of questions to go through. And I think, again, being an educated uh, patient is, you know, part of that step, but we can't expect that because there's cultural issues, there's educational issues, there's access issues that interfere with that. I think we are getting to the point where we're going to wrap things up. We've had some really good ideas come out from this discussion with regard to transparency, with regard to uh, removing the taboo of talking about cost and encouraging oncologists and other health care givers to um, understand the costs and um, understand what families are going through. I especially appreciate Gary's suggestion that we all become very politically aware and active and get out and vote. And if we think that there might be a better health care system that we can um, get for ourselves, work to achieve that. Any last thoughts from any of you before we hit the road? We need more meetings like this. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well said. Can I just make one quick comment? I do want to echo that. I think when we watch the news, all we hear lots of uh, traumatic stories, and it's, it's like we have forgotten to take care of one another to make it very simple. And I do want to thank Benet and all the organizers of this meeting and all of you because the people in this room really are caring about taking care of one another, which is really what it's all about in the end. The organization, I think, just being so inclusive and including all the people um, that you did from you know uh, the the whole spectrum from the patients to the providers to the payers to managers that kind of stuff and uh, you know, politi politicians trying to reach every pocket that's involved in this that has a vested interest I think really adds to the conversation. You know, I, I go to many conferences. This is the first time I've been to a conference like this. And I, I really want to congratulate you. Bringing these world-class experts here, bringing everybody here, it's no simple feat. And I, I, it's worth repeating it again and again. Thank you for this great discussion, great moderation. Thank you so much. Thanks for staying back. And have a good weekend, whatever that's left out.